There's nothing more important than quality health care for you and your family. That's why UTMB Health is in the communities where you live, providing easy access to innovative care. At UTMB, we know our patients need personalized care to lead healthy and fulfilling lives, providing everything from primary care and specialty care to urgent care and emergency medicine. UTMB knows health care. UTMB knows you. To find a UTMB doctor near you, visit utmbhealth.com. And hi, everyone. TJ Alls, I-45 now in Galveston now. And welcome to another edition of Healthcare Unmasked, presented by UTMB Health. We're glad to have you along today and our second show in our big old studio here at UTMB's Levin Hall. We're glad to have everyone along here uh, for the show today. Interesting topic is it is what we like to call around here is getting ready for Go Red Month, as I like to refer to. Uh, April, we'll be uh, talking a little bit about the big Go Red luncheon that's coming up uh, in a little bit in April. But first, we're going to talk about women and heart care uh, along the way. And uh, joining us now is a special guest, Dr. Hani Janit, uh, who is, uh, the. I mean, his title is as long as everybody else's, you will see as I'm reading it off here. But most important, he's the chief of the division of cardiovascular medicine here uh, at UTMB Health. Dr. Janit, thanks for coming on with us today. We appreciate it. TJ, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you and congratulations on the success of I-45 and the healthcare and mask problem. Yeah, it's uh, our, we're now in our third year of the show and doing well with that. And this is such an important topic. Uh, and I wanted this to kind of start off with you on there is a lot of times when we talk about health, heart health, mm -hmm. people are focused a lot of times on men's heart health. That seems to get a lot of the attention. But that sneaky killer in one day like that is with women. Can you talk about why we need to pay a special attention to that with women and also what's happening that makes the differences between men and women and when it comes to heart health? That's a great question, uh, TJ. So, yes, it's a big misconception that heart attacks and heart disease happen only in men. It happened in women and in men. And actually, heart disease and heart attack in particular is the number one killer in women. And it kills more women than all cancers combined. So it's a huge impact on uh, mortality. Also, large impact on morbidity. Uh, women not only die, uh, every actually uh, 90 seconds, a woman die of a heart attack. In the U.S., uh, every 40 to 45 seconds, a person dies of a heart attack. But every 90 seconds, it's a woman. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the presentation of heart attack and heart disease in women. There's also disparity in treatments. So women are not as uh, well treated as men when they present with heart disease and heart attack in particular. There's under treatment, there's under diagnosis, and there's also under recognition of symptoms uh, and part of it may be related to some differences in the presentations when women present with a heart attack in particular. And, and I wondered too, and you brought up that sometimes as mixed diagnosed it uh, along the way is that we have a kind of a two front thing. The mm -hmm. patient has to have more right. knowledge and more importantly, so do those in your world and in, in, in the medical field, correct? So that's exactly right, TJ. So it's a, it's really, there are two facets of the equation. One is a woman try to minimize their symptoms and do not recognize their symptoms. They think that heart disease and particularly heart attack is a disease of men. And this is not true. Um, and also, even among ER physicians and all physicians, when women present with chest discomfort or chest pain, we do not recognize their symptoms as readily as we do for men. And that results in delay in treatments, under recognition of symptoms, and under treatments as well. So it's on both sides of the equation. Absolutely uh, right. And one of the things, too, is, is that you the most interesting thing I think mm -hmm. we just heard from you is, is that heart, that when dealing issues with heart kill more women than all cancers combined. Correct. Now, I think a lot of folks would go, whoa, hang on for a second. We got breast cancer awareness in October. That's one. I think in the in the mindset of the public, it is cancer, cancer, cancer. Correct. When the whole time they're need. And they, we, I'm not going to say, hey, we don't pay attention to cancer, but this is 
as important, if not more so. That's I mean, the statistics are the statistics. It's number one killer of man and woman in the United States. Heart disease in general worldwide is number one killer, and 50% of those are related to coronary artery blockages and heart attacks. And that's true. Heart attack kill more women than all cancers combined. That's exactly right. And what can we do to do a better job in society to prevent that? <clears throat> so uh, good recognition of symptoms, good education of the public, uh, as well as enhance processes in the healthcare medical systems. How much, when you said in the hands uh, of being able to look at this, I, the one thing I've I've heard, and, and, and particularly thanks to the American Heart Association, which, which we're going to be hearing more mm -hmm. from uh, mm -hmm. our local chapter here, mm -hmm. is that there was a lot of education with mm -hmm. the AHA right now mm -hmm. of that for the longest time that, that the patients are different mm -hmm. in how they describe their symptoms. Correct. And that is where things will throw off uh, for folks that go in and see their physician. And then... And then the second layer is that sometimes the physicians will mm -hmm. dismiss what a woman's saying versus what the guy is saying. And I wonder why that happens. So, uh, TJ, spot on. Uh, let's go back to these symptoms. Uh, so initial misconception was that women present with a typical presentation or different set of symptoms than men. To a certain extent, it may be true. There are women present with additional symptoms in addition to chest discomfort or chest pain or chest tightness. There are some accompanying symptoms that maybe are more prevalent in women, but both men and women really present as a presenting symptom with heart attack. They present with tightness, heaviness, uh, pressure, or any of the chest discomfort, chest pain equivalent. Women tend to have more shortness of breath, more nausea uh, or vomiting. So additional features. Uh, so, yes, the constellation of symptoms a little bit different, but not that different as much as we used to think. And also, healthcare professionals, now there are more and more awareness. And a large part of this is due to the major work that's done by the American Heart Association. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you, in 08, we published a paper uh, uh, that was the uh, on gender disparities in care and outcomes after a heart attack. That was a grant sponsored by the American Heart Association. Actually, it was the first national grant from the Get With a Guideline program, which is a uh, health system improvement program that the American Heart initiated in mid 2000s. We published that work uh, in 2008 in Circulation, which is the journal of the American Heart Association with the premier journals. We looked at more than 60 or 70,000 patients presenting with heart attack, compared care and outcomes, man versus woman. And with one special type of heart attack, the most severe one, woman at that time had almost double the mortality in hospital. Part of it under treatment. We were able to show in the same work that there's delay in giving clot buster medication to right. women when they present with a heart attack. That was 15 years ago. Recurrent studies and analysis showed that there's still disparity in treatments. We're doing better, but not perfect. We're still discriminating because of the lack of knowledge, lack of recognition on both sides. One of the things, though, too, again, it's a two-part process. The patient has to be aware Correct. of their conditions. And I, when I was preparing for this show, and mm -hmm. you and I had met mm -hmm. last week or two weeks mm -hmm. ago, and then mm -hmm. uh, and then getting ready for the show, I happened to be bring this up to my wife, and she says, "Well, it's mainly it's because you guys complain a lot. You get a little pain, and you complain more than women." And I said, oh, "I, I kind of laugh." She says, "No, that's true." And I wondered, I, and I Actually, was reading over some of the studies, true. and that is true that true. men will complain more about Correct. their pain than women will. And I just, Correct. I, I found that an oddity there. Correct. So, so there's increased awareness about the importance of chest pain, or let me call it chest discomfort, because it may not be pain. It could be tightness, pressure, uh, heaviness, and squeezing. Uh, so yes, men tend to complain more and bring this to the attention, to the forefront, and maybe call 911 faster than women. Women underestimate their symptoms and delay recognition of their symptoms. So once once you're in doubt, call 911. Right. That's it, really the yeah. very important take-home message. There's no reason for delay. Time is muscle, by the way, when it comes to a heart attack. Right. 
very important. And we're going to talk more about that when we uh, come back here in just a little bit, because this is this is going to be a super important part of this topic is uh, Dr. Neely has got some we, we can give you some heart health education here so you can understand the difference. And we'll be doing that after these words from our friends at UTMB Health. UTMB knows when you're expecting, you may not know exactly what to expect from that first embrace to all the milestones that follow. We know how important each stage of life is. That's why UTMB Health's obstetrics and gynecology physicians specialize in innovative women's health care through all phases of life. UTMB knows women's health. UTMB knows you. To find an OBGYN specialist near you, visit utmbhealth.com forward slash women's. And welcome back to Healthcare Unmasked. And uh, I'm TJ Alds along with Dr. Hani Janid, uh, who is uh, really already here in our first few minutes of this show, he has opened up my eyes even more so to this topic about women's health and dealing with the heart. And this is one of the things I think the most important thing we'll be able to, to, to tell folks in general, but as well as specifically with women, is when you're dealing with understanding how your heart works. And 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 so I thought we'd start off, you bring us in with a slide, and obviously it's the quintessential, the the graph of the heart here. Uh, tell us what we're looking at here. I'm going to yeah. turn my screen so you can see a little bit better yeah. here so folks can understand you yes. know, what we're looking at. Uh, thank you, TJ. Yeah, this is a scheme showing the heart, and around the heart in red are these coronary arteries. These, you would want to think about them as like pipelines that supply blood, which bring oxygen and nutrients to the heart muscle. So when we have a heart attack, there's an interruption, usually sudden, to the coronary blood flow through these pipelines that bring nutrient and oxygen to the heart muscle. If we do not restore perfusion or coronary blood flow through these pipelines in a timely manner, that would result in death of the heart segment that's being supplanted or uh, perfused by that coronary artery. Uh, in general, each one of us has three coronary arteries, two on the left, one on the right. The left arteries supply nearly 75% or so of the heart muscle, and the one on the right around 25, maybe a little bit more depending on variation in anatomy, 25% uh, plus of the heart muscle. And when you and you say an important thing where right before we took the break was that time is muscle. Absolutely. And you just talked about the heart muscle. Explain that way if you would. So so once you get a sudden interruption by any of the mechanisms, there are multiple mechanisms that cause this sudden interruption to the blood flow. You would want to, depending on the type of heart attack, whether it's a complete interruption or not, you would want to go ahead and do an emergent procedure like an angioplasty put a wire, put a balloon, and inflate this to restore the blood flow to the muscle. And this should be done in a timely manner because the more prolonged the interruption to the blood flow, the more the heart muscle is devoid of nutrient and oxygen and the muscle will die. Right. And death will be irreversible, will lead to congestive heart failure, abnormal heart rhythm, possibly death. Uh, and this is uh, talking about the, the plaque rupture that you were talking about before. That's exactly right, TJ. So this is a scheme of the heart artery, one of the pipelines. And you could see that there are plaque or rustiness that develop within the artery of the heart. And this, by the way, develop as early as the first or second decades in life. Wow. Very important to pay attention to risk factors and obesity in children. And good nutrition in children these plaques or fatty streaks described in the first decade or second decade of life progress over time and rustiness build within the pipeline. Now, I'm, it's a simplistic overview of this. This is not a pipeline that's rigid. It right. also have a spasm. It's a dynamic pipeline. But as the plaque grows, sometimes it goes to the outside initially. It does not impinge in the lumen. Over time, grows to the inside. And then it becomes unstable in such a way as it can rupture or erodes, it exposes the material, rusty material inside the plaque to the blood. That causes within seconds a formation of a clot that can either interrupt fully or partially the blood flow. That's why we advise aspirin and blood thinner mm -hmm. to prevent the preparation or propagation of the clot. And if it's complete obstruction, balloon, 
angioplasty or mechanical way to open it up is the way to go in a timely manner. So when we hear uh, at times the reference to someone has so much blockage in their artery or the like, that's we're talking about that plaque buildup. What I, what I found, I heard for the first time from you explained uh, something that we probably should know, but you explained it in the most simplistic forms here is mm -hmm. that most of that happens in before you're 20 years old. So what your diet is as young Correct. matters to what your heart's going to be 50 years from. It's a long-term are... investment. Yeah. It's not only your diet, your physical activity, exercise, lack of tobacco cessation, and the myriad of risk factors that you need to control for. Now, some people do all the right things in life and nevertheless have heart attacks. But because there's some genetic components to right. it that you cannot do anything about, it's hereditary. But in 90 or 80 to 90% of the time, you will find the risk factor that can be modified. High blood pressure, obesity, physical activity, sedentary, or a combination of those. I may have a slide that may show, actually that's another slide showing a cross section of the artery, showing how the plaques can grow over time, and that will cause chest discomfort during exercise, but also it may not grow, it may grow minimally, and then rupture suddenly, and that causes the heart attack. So there are two types of plaques, some that rupture or erodes, cause heart attacks, some that continue growing and cause limitation in physical activity. Right. And on that line, I, and you said something earlier, like when you recognize a problem, you need to call for help, either 911 or a doctor. And one of the times I think that happens often is, is that someone will exert themselves during a workout and say, oh, man, my chest is tight. You know, when, and I'll, and, and they'll just say, oh, that's just because of the workout. But that may be a symptom early on that you really need to go get checked on, on that because it could be that's the early sign that you're going to have that pack, that plaque buildup that could at some time rupture in and cause a heart attack, right? That's exactly right, TJ. And the recognition of symptoms are key. We call it chest pain, but it does not have to be pain. It could be heaviness. It's I would call it chest discomfort. Right. Actually, angina pectoris, described more than 100, 200 years ago, is what you call strangulation in the chest. Discomfort, heaviness, pressure, sometimes shortness of breath, dizziness, pallor, uh, uh, radiation to the jaw, neck, to the shoulders and arms. Very important to recognize this. It can happen when it's unstable at rest or with very minimal exertion, when the plaque is stable, it could happen on exercise. And both are ominous, both needs attention. The one that happened at rest is the one precursor for a heart attack. Right. 911, very ominous. You said something here, it can occur at rest. Absolutely. So a lot of times, and mm -hmm. I, I just was talking to, to a lady here just recently about this, uh, that she was talking about, I was totally asleep and woke up because my heart was racing. but And she says that shouldn't happen and gets worried. And so that is a sign, Correct. a symptom. Yeah. You should need to get it checked out further. Correct. So there have been some studies, some are actually happened in Mass General in Boston many years ago, showing that there's a, there is what you call circadian rhythm to heart attacks. They happen in the early morning hours where the blood is more prone to be thicker, to blood clotting, early morning hours. Uh, so there's a pattern to heart attacks. There's also right. some seasonality. But uh, in addition to that, there are other things that can happen to the heart uh, and when you're sleeping or during activity, like fast heartbeats, like atrial fibrillation. This fast heartbeats, when going too fast, it will put exertion or stress on the heart. So if you've got a blockage that's 50, 60% or even 70% and you start having this fast heartbeat, it will unmask or bring on the symptoms that they wouldn't happen otherwise because your heart rate is not to a certain level because you haven't been exerting yourself. And what makes your blood thicker in the middle it's, of the night? I, I, I had never heard some, that before. Some, some, it's it's uh, uh, metabolic neurohormonal uh, factors. Yeah, uh, It's been well described. It's also some of it to do with catecholamine release uh, uh, and spikes of blood pressure at night. So it's a complex physiologic mechanisms. But it's well documented that spasm and blood clotting may happen in the early morning. Uh, and they, that's why people wake up in the middle of the night. And I think this is, uh, folks, if you're hearing me ask these, hey, wait, I've never heard this before. And here it is, somebody 
you know, and I bring this up a lot. I have access to every single one of y'all here at this facility all the time, more access than a lot of folks. And even I'm hearing a lot of this for the first time, even after you and I had a great conversation mm -hmm. uh, before about mm -hmm. this. And, and so if you have questions, folks, and I want to thank our viewers who are already mm -hmm. comment. We've had comments about they love this information. But if you have questions, this is the time to ask. Absolutely. And we'd like to you know, make sure you put them in the comment section here. Uh, let's. Uh, bring up this next slide here because uh, this is, you know, when you call 911, you've talked about that a couple of times. So when you're in doubt, chest discomfort or any of the constellation of symptoms that they could be chest angina pectoris equivalent. Sometimes older patient, for example, becomes irritable and short of breath and dizzy. They may not even have chest discomfort. Diabetic, by the way, who have neuropathy may not feel chest pain. They feel nausea, vomiting, uh, uh, shortness of breath. Women, again, have chest tightness or chest pain or chest discomfort, but they have additional constellation of symptoms like shortness of breath and nausea. Any of those, when you're in doubt, call 911. By the way, never drive to the hospital. Call 911. Because you could, yeah. Absolutely. You, yeah, you could uh, have a heart uh, ailment. Actually, one of my colleagues, an ER physician in my previous drove himself knowing that he's having a chest discomfort and he's an ER physician. He said, nothing is going to happen to me. He said, what are you talking about? What if something happened to you while you're driving? Right. And you could hurt yourself and hurt others. Yeah. The other thing I put in is also take an aspirin. Uh, and EMS will give you an aspirin. We initially ask people to have a full aspirin to chew so that it can be absorbed because, you know, clotting is a major right. uh, part of the pathophysiology of the blood flow interruption and very importantly also they will give you sublingual nitroglycerin to uh, vasodilate the arteries and prevent the excessive load on the heart on the aspirin let me in because there's this is a small part that i sure. had to get griped at about because i would type and just pop the aspirin and drink it no that i was told you need to chew it what's the difference between just taking an aspirin Passage. And so chewing it just gets it into your system. It goes into the sublingual plexus, uh -huh. this, uh, uh, this plexus of small arteries underneath the tongue, and it gets absorbed faster. We want aspirin or a strong antiplatelet clotting, anti-clotting effect right. quicker than that. Now, we talk about people suspected of having a heart attack. That's what you call secondary prevention, when you're preventing something that's happening. Now, primary prevention in the population level no longer we advise to take aspirin routinely. That was just about to ask that. Yeah. Because I know this is, I have still many patients who are coming in, haven't seen doctor for a while, said, well, I was told to take a aspirin every day. That used to be the norm many years ago, five years ago or so. In the last five years or so, we have a lot of evidence, even in diabetic without heart attacks, even in patients with a blocked arteries of the leg. As long as they don't have heart attacks or blocked arteries of the heart, there's no strong evidence to take aspirin. There's more risk of bleeding taking aspirin in healthy patients than preventing a heart attack. So the risk-benefit ratio is not there anymore. So okay. that's why we do not recommend routine aspirin for a primary prevention in healthy subjects. Actually, above 70 years of age, it's absolute contraindication because of an increased harm. Gotcha. And, and if your doctor takes, like, for example, I take a baby aspirin uh -huh. once a day, uh -huh. all the time. And if you're healthy on a right. healthy for a healthy subject, never had a heart attack or heart problem before, no need to. Gotcha. Even diabetic, but no heart attack or no heart issues before, no need to. Nothing. Now, if you've God forbid, had a heart attack or any heart disease, then yes, you will need aspirin for life. And by the way, the paradigm now no longer needed the full aspirin, baby aspirin. Baby aspirin. It's right. the same efficacy when it comes to diminishing clotting, but it's lesser bleeding. On the and, stomach. And easier. I think part of this, too, is, is that you said this has kind of changed in the last five years or so. The important part to know here is, is to pay attention as the information develops and changes. The problem is, is getting that word out. I mean, I, I remember the bear commercials that always said the heart healthy aspirin. That was the big thing they would always promote. Sure. And now that you've said this, I haven't seen those commercials in the last five years or so. This is the reason why. But this it, but it's inbreded into us. It's right. it, like told over and over and over again. And after you've done that, it becomes a habit and folks still follow through so, with that. TJ, I'm glad you said that. It takes, and the American Heart looked at that in the past. And I was a member of a few writing committees of the guidelines by the American Heart. Uh, it takes 17 years for guidelines to get implemented in clinical practice. 
because sometimes people are not updated or not keeping up with the new flow of information. Things are very dynamic. What was true five, six years ago is no longer true now. Not because we were wrong five, six years ago. It was correct for the context of the time. Right. Now we have some other treatments, including good cholesterol medications, other treatments that lower the risk in such a way as we don't need an aggressive blood clotting treatment as before. Gotcha. So it's there's more knowledge, more knowledge, and we also different treatments, right? And I think we need to explain to folks on this is that that along the way, yes, people said, well, they used to tell me this. Now they're telling me this. They were wrong, and you made a good point. No, we were right within the context of what we knew at the time. That's exactly right. And TJ, let me tell you, very important. Uh, like I have a clinic today, this mm -hmm. afternoon. Very important for when I see my patient, I tell them, please bring two things: all your medications with you. Bring also a list of your medications with the doses with you because the medication need to be constantly adjusted because what was true a year ago, six months ago, may no longer be true now. Gotcha. In fact, we have a uh, one of our viewers in is asking this question now. And uh, uh, Nutricia, I think that's how it's said. Nutricia, thanks uh, for this. More, she says, I, um, she says, I had chest pains and shortness of breath off. And I would take off and on. And I've been in the emergency room by ambulance before. And they told me that she had something else in this case. But it's one thing go by ambulance, go to the emergency room. That's like a quick diagnosis. And she said, she asked right out there, what do I need to do? I would take it. Your recommendation is go see a cardiologist, go see a heart doctor. hundred percent, hundred percent. Not every chest pain or chest discomfort is heart related. And some of it is heart related, but may not be related to blocked arteries. There are other reasons that are heart related, but not artery blockages or mm -hmm. heart attack inducing. Some are, for example, inflammation of the lining of the heart. It's called pericarditis. It's a benign condition that needs anti-inflammatory medications and would subside. There are also chest pain related symptoms that are not heart related at all. Could be musculoskeletal and uh, could be uh, some uh, cervical disc disease, uh, could be sometimes a heartburn masquerading as heart symptoms. Uh, so seeing a cardiologist, I think, is the right way to do. And we have diagnostic tests to sort out besides history, physical exam, and electrocardiogram. We can do stress testing and ultrasound of the heart. So we can look at the heart from different angles and tell you, is it heart related or not? Is it a blockages related or not? Or it's something else unrelated to the heart? Patricia, thanks for your question on that. And the answer here was important. You don't know exactly just by a quick diagnosis in the ER. I, and, and understand, there's nothing wrong with what the ER folks told you. It's just, it's going to be, hey, is this something we got to triage and take care of right away? Or do we got to go to the next step? And I'm sure at the end, when you sign it, it says, make sure you follow up. Because I every time I've seen anyone go to the ER or myself afterwards, it's always follow up with your physician. That's the step I think a lot of folks miss Absolutely. as well, is making sure they're doing that regular checkup, right? I'm, I'm so glad you brought this up. Uh, so TJ, currently, uh, so the American Heart and the American College of Cardiology published national guidelines on chest pain in November 2021. It was a small writing group, maybe a handful of people. I was one of the writing groups. We wrote the chest pain guidelines. It took us several years. And we are currently, by the way, implementing those guidelines at UTMB with chest pain pathways. Chest pain could be triaged based on scores, heart scores, when people present to the emergency room, as well as blood tests into low risk, intermediate risk, or a high risk. High risk, you would need cardiac cath, angiograms, and some other stuff. Intermediate, you may need stress testing and observation unit. Right. Low risk, you can be discharged to be followed up by an expert and do additional testing. I wonder, though, too, if we, you know, particularly with women's health, we hear, go get your breast, you know, mammogram, go get a pap smear, go get, we hear those, both men and women, what I do not hear on a regular basis is, go get your heart checked. I now, really... For men, we say, hey, go get your colonoscopy, go get, you know, go this test, this test. But I do not hear on a regular basis, except, well, I do from my doctor. She's always telling me to do this. But for folks in general, they're not being told, yeah. go in and get your heart checked. I, I agree with you, TJ. There should be focus not only on heart disease when things happen, on heart health, how to promote heart health. 
and uh, checkups happen as early as 20 years of age. I mean, the American Heart Primary Prevention Guidelines, they were published in 2019. They advocate every four to six years to have checks on your blood pressure, lipids. And then they're also objective. So, and your primary care as well as potential cardiologists should be screening for the risk factors, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, physical activity, tobacco, and so forth. And there are also risk scores that are objective that you could calculate by plugging in the equation, very mathematical, the 10-year risk and the 30-year risk and even the lifetime risk in young patients of having heart events. So when patients come to me, I would tell them, these are your risk factors, but also this is your risk score. Right. And we could tell them you are into this risk category, and as such, I would advise cholesterol medication. Not only to prevent heart attacks, but also to prevent death, prevent stroke, prevent need for open heart surgery, and to mitigate mitigate cardiovascular risk. And I know you got to get out to clinic here. Oh, no, fact, I, I've got all the. Yeah, I, I love that. Too. And uh, so uh, I, I want to go into more of this uh, with what you provided us here. Yeah, is that we can talk about what's abnormal and normal yes. infarction. Here. So to the left side, and I don't know if you could play this. To the left side, that's a yeah. That's unfortunately, a we can't play got, the video back. So. Yeah. Uh, so you could see a the cross section of a heart and the heart cavity is small because the heart is contracting. It's That's what the heart is supposed to be. It's a mechanical pump. It's beyond the mechanical pump. Right. It has electrical activity, it has valves, it has pipelines, but part of it is a mechanical pump activity to pump the blood forward. And here you see it's doing its job because the small cavity, the heart is pumping because it's unaffected by heart attack. On the right side, you see that the cavity is big because it's unable to vigorously pump because that's one of the problems with heart attack. The consequence of heart attack, if it doesn't kill you, it can cause weakening of the heart muscle, can cause congestive heart failure, could cause abnormal heart rhythms, and a lot of problems. Wow. it's it, We're learning so much here. Uh, Becky, I know, is already writing her notes, and David Bethay, our producer here, is writing this as well, is that uh, we're going to have you back on as soon as we can uh, here, because as I said, just in these 30 minutes pleasure. of what we have learned uh, so far, uh, and then you'd also mention this blood pressure management and how important this is uh, along the so way, T particularly with women. TJ, it's extremely important for both men and women. And uh, by the way, uh, when the guidelines were changed in late 2017 to change the threshold for what we call hypertension or high blood pressure, mm -hmm. now it's 130 over 80 rather than 140 over 90 because we have better data that the target should be lower to uh, improve cardiovascular health. Nearly one in two U.S. adults have high blood pressure. And uh, it's it's the silent killer. And the reason I'm putting emphasis on it is because it can be mitigated with lifestyle interventions, even before adding medications. And it's extremely important in both man and woman. And there are some good lifestyle interventions that can be readily done that can reduce the blood pressure to the target, which has been changed, by the way, in late 2017, early 2018, new guidelines, GNC8, changed the targets. What we used to think is a hypertension five years ago is no longer what we now, we used to say one in three have high blood pressure, now it's one in two. Wow, Things have so changed. half. Correct, 47% of US adults have, correct? Absolutely. Wow. And it's a silent killer because people do not feel anything for a long time. And this high blood pressure, putting strain on your heart and your arteries for a long time. And all of a sudden, 15, it's not all of a sudden. You think it's all of a sudden. But it's, it's really been brewing. Not, it's been years. that way probably That's the whole exactly time. And, and then you think, can we do something about it? Of course, there are lifestyle interventions that we can do to really reduce blood pressure and reduce, reduce the strain on the heart. Wow. Things it, are like low sodium, a good diet, like a DASH diet, measuring. Uh, good sleep pattern, looking at other secondary reasons for high blood pressure. Uh, for example, in women, there's a very, uh, it's unusual entity or infrequent called uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, some renal artery related issues that maybe can contribute to a small percentage of hypertension in women, but still important not to overlook. Well, and I'm going to bring this back up on the, on the screen here again, because, you know, as we take a closer look at it, mm -hmm. it talks about weight control, mm -hmm. increased physical activity, alcohol moderation, sodium reduction, increased consumption of fresh fruits, vegetables, and low-fat dairy products. 
And I, <laughs> this was the uh, kind of a snarky line uh, from someone the other day who told me because I was talking about the subject and I was getting fascinated with all the research papers that you wrote. By the way, we're going to have a link to Dr. Janine's research because it's fascinating stuff if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of, of how this has looked. But uh, and, and it just came into it's like, well, yeah, I go to my cardiologist, but he just takes all the fun out of it. Uh, and so and but really what you're talking about in anything is moderation here. It is. Yes, you can go have that drink every uh, once in a while, but you just Correct. don't overdo it. That's it's exactly not right. about yes. cutting everything out of your life. Correct. It's a balance, obviously. And as you get older, you want to pay closer attention. By the way, back to weight. Every one kilogram or 2.2 pounds corresponds to a one millimeter reduction in uh, uh, blood pressure. So 20 pounds or so is a 10 millimeter, is as effective as a blood pressure medication. Wow. So it don't, so so that's extremely important. Low sodium, by the way. And yeah. a lot of it is eating non-processed, processed, non-fresh food, by the way. And we're seeing a lot of that change as well. You know, used to, we'd have the food pyramid and everything right. else. But what has come in and the recommendations and the availability of those non-processed foods right. that uh, change so, things. So the like. American Heart, TJ, uh, really, there are two important diets to know about. One is Mediterranean diet, mm -hmm. which is mostly geared to reduce uh, heart attacks and blockages and coronary artery disease. And then there's the DASH diet that's geared towards uh, reducing blood pressure. So if you have predominantly hypertension problem, you go with a DASH diet. Mm -hmm. A DASH diet, for example, it's been well studied, it can reduce blood pressure nearly by 10 to 11 millimeter, as good or better than a blood pressure medication. Now it consists of legumes, fruits, vegetables, non-fat dairy products, low in saturated fats, low sodium, and uh, uh, nuts. And uh, you add the uh, extra virgin olive oil to your salads and some fish twice servings a week, then you become a Mediterranean diet. So they're very right. overlapping. But DASH diet is extremely important. And you could see there are some formulations called DASH salts, which right. really low sodium, high potassium salts. You want These are good, but you want to be very careful. Make sure the kidney function and the potassium levels are with the normal range before you take those. But a good diet for high blood pressure, for example, the DASH diet is extremely important. Weight loss, extremely important. Physical activity. The American Heart recommends now, if you want to do moderate intensity activity, 150 minutes a week. So that's 30 minutes a day, preferably seven days a week, but if not, five days a week of 30 minutes moderate intensity activity. And that and that means getting your heart rate up. Exactly. That. That's not just, hey, go walking. Exactly. So it's not a slow walking. Right. It's a moderate or it's a moderate intensity. Moderate intensity prototype will be a swimming, not competitive swimming, but swimming and fast walking. Right. You would want to reach around 70% of your maximally predicted heart rate. So you walk. And if you're in a conversation, you can't catch your statement or because you're slightly short of breath. So that's how it is. Not running, but not slow walking. Right, yeah. So uh, so all these, and alcohol in moderation. For, for women, for example, no more than one glass of wine or uh, uh, alcohol uh, uh, every evening. And for men, two glasses. Not that we're advocating to drink, but if you drink, for women, limit to one glass. So you're saying I can have two drinks. My wife's my wife's limited to one. Is it? No, I'm just kidding. I'm I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm no, I wanted to bring up that point because it, it is based on physiology. Uh, so, and when we, we bring that up, but some people I'm hear it that way. To drink. Either not one. That, yeah, no, no, yeah, no. Yeah, but not. I'm just saying. Yeah. If you do, but it still points out if you do, this is what you do. Yeah. It's moderation. Correct. Always. And, and also, there's differences in body habitus, right? Right. And women are usually smaller body mass index, so they tolerate lesser alcohol than than men. But there are all these lifestyle interventions. And if it doesn't work, then you go to medications. Right. And by the way, even physicians and healthcare providers do a great job prescribing medications. Um, and I'm one of those that can, I can. I lifestyle can, interventions initially. In the, yeah. But even in those when I've, you know, I can just have high blood pressure has been an issue for me, for me forever. And it wasn't until more recently that we finally got the right balance of meds along with my diet changes and everything else. They got the lower part of my blood pressure down. Gotcha. That was what we were dealing with. Gotcha. And, you know, that 130 over 80 uh, is being the goal out sure, there. Sure. And now, um, and it, this is just fascinating that how much has changed. You, know, you were talking about 2017, we just had changes. 2018, we had changes. 
And that's why we need to make sure we're encouraging folks to do that. And one of the places you can get that information, by the way, is the American Heart Association. And uh, we're going to be talking about a special event uh, that's coming up, and that's the Go Red Luncheon uh, that UTMB, you're you're on with them as well on this. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be talking about that when we come back. This is Healthcare Unmasked from, from UTMB Health. UTMB knows that good joint and bone health is the key to a pain-free and active lifestyle. UTMB Health Orthopedics specializes in providing innovative care for common and advanced orthopedic issues, including sports injuries and total joint replacement. UTMB knows orthopedics. UTMB knows you. To find a UTMB Health Specialist near you, visit utmbhealth.com forward slash ortho. UTMB Health knows that when you need advanced surgical care, you want a specialist who's an expert in their field. Our surgeons provide innovative and advanced treatment options for adults and children, for neurosurgery, GI, heart surgery, ENT, urology, and more. UTMB knows surgical care. UTMB knows you. To find a UTMB Health Specialist near you, visit utmbhealth.com. And welcome back to Healthcare Unmasked. I'm TJ Alds along with uh, our special guest today, uh, Dr. Hani Janine. And uh, it's been just a fascinating talk. And now an even more special guest <laughs> coming on with us. It's Macy Osario from the uh, American Heart Association's uh, Bay Area. Hi, Macy. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. I have just been loving and learning, hearing everything that Dr. Janine is saying. It's, it's fascinating. Even me working for the AHA, it's just news and, and info I've never heard before. Well, and that's what I was going to bring up is, is that, hey, you're involved in this on a on a day to day basis. And even you are hearing some new information from this. And every time we get involved with the with Go Red, it's the same thing for me when you and I are talking about something like, hey, here's our new initiative and and, and the like. And if this is ever evolving. And maybe the most important thing we say today, Dr. Janine and Macy, is that that. When we when we get into the into the show, that's not the information that you're gonna need always. It's gonna change. And it's this is where getting regular checkups, always talking to your doctor and keeping up uh, with things. And the, one of the best ways is the American Heart Association, because y'all are keeping up with this research and putting information out on a regular basis. Definitely, definitely. Things are always changing. Um and, and we recognize that here and we always, our resources are honestly great. I can't tell you how many times I go to an event that they're hosting us and they print off all these resources. Um, and it's really honestly on heart.org. You can go on that website and there are some great resources for between uh, diet, like Dr. Jean was saying, or workouts, healthy lifestyle choices. So we are, you're exactly right. We're always evolving with our information. Well, let's talk about a very special event coming up in uh, in April, as you see it on your screen there. April 21st, the South Shore Harbor in League City. It's the annual uh, Bay Area Go Red for Women Luncheon. Uh, tell us about that, Max, because this is, this is not only is it an important event, but it's an actual very fun event for us to attend <laughs> every year, I tell you. Yes, uh, that is exactly what I try to say, too, is it's a social and informative educational event. We try to tie in both together. Um, this event is very near and dear to my heart. I have met some amazing people through um, the past couple of years of being able to be with this event, but it is April 21st at South Shore Harbor. Uh, we have um, tons of sponsors, UTMB being our biggest sponsor, um, which is we're so thankful for. And we have our two co-chairs of the event, um, Dr. Janine, of course, representing UTMB, and then also um, our very favorite, Amy, who is um, uh, actually a heart survivor that we honored from the past year. So this is very, um, very near and dear to her heart. And, you know, we we enjoy having her. But yes, it's a, it's a great event. Um, our, our goal is to truly just raise awareness about women's health and what, you know, exactly the things Dr. Janine was talking about, preventative ways, how to, you know, have a healthy lifestyle, what to look for. We want to get this across, not only when people are socializing and having fun, but we're, we want them to take away something when they leave. And it's a packed lunch, I should point out, uh, every every year, too. Uh, and one of the things is that, Dr. Janine, having you involved uh, with this as well, it is a combination of expertise and 
reaching the masses uh, in a way that uh, most people didn't think about years ago. It was always just go to your doctor. But you recognize, hey, we got to get the message out one way or another absolutely. and take every avenue you can, right? Yeah, absolutely, DG. And the American Heart Association has been uh, great at this. It's not only funding research and enhancing education and advancing clinical care, but also advocacy and sending the message to the public. And this partnership between academic medical centers like UTMB and the American Heart, extremely important. Uh, because you said you said it right. Knowledge is always is dynamic, always yep. getting updated. And the concentration of academic of expertise in academic medical centers is where the flow of information from research goes to practice first in academic medical centers because we're training fellows we're doing research you have to be updated constantly and you have always to be interacting with the american heart association and the funded research from the american heart and the supported research by the american hearts to be at the forefront yeah and one of the and amy doherty who is going to be uh, the the keynote uh at this luncheon this year special woman to me personally a, a dear friend and uh and if you don't know owns robinette catering and if you want to have good food and good for you mediterranean too. yeah mediterranean that she specializes <laughs> in. i had never known a caterer that said you want the mediterranean diet and she offered i was like perfect i mean and and amy is one of those she said she attended this luncheon every single year because she'd go with her friends and she'd hear information that, but then she heard something that kind of struck with her and found out, oh my gosh, I need to do something about this. And she ended up having surgery because of that, because of this luncheon, which I yes. think is so vitally important because it's not just, yes, we have the good time and, and, and the auction and everything else, but it is very educational uh, as well. Right, Mace? That's exactly right. I mean, she is the epitome of what we want to happen at this luncheon is for her to have something that resonated with her and she make moves about it. Um, we really, really encourage, honestly, the working woman to be there because those are the ones that tend to just slough off their symptoms and keep moving and keep, you know, working. And we really want those women to be there because, you know, they value their job sometimes more than their health. And and yeah. again, that's that's important to us, just like Amy did. She runs around like crazy. And, you know, so that's that's exactly right. Yeah, it's what she's told us. She was on our show last year uh, as we were getting ready for this. And that's exactly what she told us was, hey, you know, I was going from one catering job to the other. I was working around. I didn't take time yeah. to really do it. But then she heard this at the luncheon and went, OK, let me go check. And sure enough, she was so close. And and, wow. and she's an inspirational story. And you want to make sure uh, men or women, by the way. Um, to attend this luncheon. Make sure you have something red on. I bought a red tie and shirt one year just for this luncheon. That's what I wear every year. Macy, tell us all what's going to be taking place on April uh, 21st at South Shore Harbor. Yeah, definitely. And by the way, tickets do go on sale um, on Monday, April 3rd. So look out for that. But um, you can expect, you know, again, a little bit of socializing. We have a lot of fun activities that are going to be taking place. But then once the luncheon begins, um, you know, we have a lot of thank yous to our sponsors. Uh, we have a great story that we're actually going to be sharing as well with um, a patient that was from UTMB. Her name is Tara. So we'll be sharing her story on, again, how she felt something happen in her body and how to and address it immediately. So we'll be sharing a survivor story. And we actually are going to be doing a short Q&A with Dr. Janine and Amy um, on stage. So something a little different this year. Yeah, a little bit added to, but I like that educational component that will be a part of it this year. And you see right there, we also have the link uh, in our comment section there from UTMB Health, which you can go to uh, uh, bayareagoread.heart.org, and you can uh, get your tickets uh, for that. Do it fast, though, because... This, this thing sells out. I mean, Monday is going to be a busy day. I know, Macy, uh, it will crash the servers, but it's going to be a busy day because it, it's a well-attended. We're going to be out there as as well. I, we had fun we, a few years ago. Uh, we did a fun video with a whole group, uh, mm -hmm. the late Chris Reed, and uh, was with us along with uh, Jim Sweeney and his wife. And we were doing this whole listening to music in a car, driving around in a parking lot and having fun of learning 
how to give CPR, for example. And, uh, uh, you know, and that it was, you know, the beat of staying alive. But we had other songs that we could tell you as well. Um, and so tell us, too, the tickets go on sale Monday. But is there anything else that people need to know about this lunch, like donations for the auction or anything like that, Macy? Great, great. Yes. Yeah, so tickets go on sale Monday. Um, we are definitely taking a sponsorship still. We would love to have someone, you know, sponsor a certain activity or a table. Um, so that is definitely still an option. Uh, we are taking some auction items, getting a little closer on that deadline, but um, truly volunteers, anything, if you think you have something for us, as a nonprofit, we're always willing to say yes. So <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and uh, how much are tickets? Uh, tickets are 125 and that includes um, your lunch. And we have a couple goodies as well that you get to walk away with. Um, and it's a, it's truly a great, great experience. So, yeah. And one of the things to be prepared, this is not just a one hour lunch. It, it, it's, it's basically an all day activity for many folks that go to this. Uh, they, they'll start out in the morning uh, there and then they're still going on the afternoon, hanging around the hotel and conversing and the like, uh, as well. So don't, don't expect just to show up, eat lunch. Here's a couple of people talk and do the Q and a and then leave. Right. I would say so. I mean, 11 o'clock is uh, the beginning of the kind of social part of it. And then 12 o'clock starts the actual luncheon. Plan on sticking around to around two o'clock. But that's the beauty of it is everyone just loves the the vibe of the day. And so it just ends up being a whole afternoon um, if needed. But we do try to respect people's times. But just come and kind of know you're going to have a longer lunch on Friday. All right. Well, I'm saying you can come in for the quick one, but it is, you get the whole experience and, and, and the spend time, the Q&A part. I love that being a feature this year and to hear directly from you. And so we hear you from the expert and Amy as a patient sure. and also someone who's dealt with these issues and learned about the issues as well. Mm -hmm. And again, it gets to the one thing I say every single show, the most important thing you'll do about your health is ask questions. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think I've said this so many times that if you don't ask questions, you're never going to know. And and you'll be amazed at what you think, you know, is wrong mm -hmm. I, and many times and maybe not, as I say, not wrong in context, it's but no longer true, no longer true. Right. I think that's a better way of saying that uh, Macy, I'm looking forward to it uh, when we uh, get out there. And uh, and uh, when, by the way, when you do go to lunch and make sure you go up to Macy and say, uh, hello, newlywed. She's still <laughs> living in her first year since getting married. And she was I, and I always have to brag about you on this. As you were getting ready for the heart walk out at the Kimber Boardwalk, you were also planning your wedding at the same time. Wow. Uh, you talk about heart stress. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and she kept it calm the entire time. Right. I don't know how she did that, but uh, it was great. So, Macy, we're looking forward to seeing you in April uh, out there. Anything else you want to make? Tell one more time how folks can get tickets. Oh, yes. Please go to Bay Area. Uh, go red at heart.org and that's where you can see the tickets go on sale on Monday, April 3rd. And what time Monday they go on sale? I believe we're going to do it at 9 a.m. So bright and mm -hmm. early. All right. And we'll put out an email blast uh, on that as well at I-45 now to make sure uh, folks see that and uh, get signed up for that. So we'll see you April 21st then, Macy. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Dr. Mead, thanks for coming on with us. Absolutely. We do appreciate it. It has been, and he said this during the break too. And I got to tell you folks, we had a little longer commercial break because he's, he's held up uh, going over to clinic. He was supposed to be back over there at one, but he felt this was important to make sure he got the information out uh, to all of you. So thanks for staying Absolutely longer with us. And you. we've already Thank agreed. We're going to have you back on again. Cause to this you. is a topic we need to talk more often about sure. and, and work with you on that. So I do appreciate it. Macy, thank you for coming on uh, as well. And thank you all for joining us for this edition of uh, healthcare on mass presented by UTMB. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>